wet meadow here. Um, directly behind the photographer, there's also a big pile of lion and other predator dung that comes from the uh, the, the National Zoo, um, and it it doesn't really appear to be great habitat. There's not very much growing on the pile of dung. Um, and just uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the district and some of the wildlife habitat here and where it's located. Uh, you can see I put uh, a lot of the national parks there in brown on the map. And if you look, if you draw a line um, about two thirds of the way up diagonally, uh, this going through the city, uh, that's the fall line between the Piedmont and the coastal plain ecoregions. And so we're split by the by the fall line, and we because of that we have a variety of habitats, um, and we have plant communities from both the Piedmont and the and the Atlantic coastal plain. Um, and then we also have many parks, as you can see. The biggest one is Rock Creek Park in the middle of the city. Um, also east of the Anacostia River, there's a large park called Fort DuPont Park. And there's a number of parks that are all connected together. They were all Civil War forts that are now forested parcels in the district, and they're very important wildlife habitat. And then the other major feature is we have two, two rivers running through the city, um, one of which the Anacostia River is significantly polluted, both um, historically with uh, chemical contamination and more modern, more recently with stormwater runoff and things like that. Um, so one of the things that we we have that guides our work is our is a wildlife action plan, and um, this is kind of what leads us to do all of our all of our wildlife and wildlife inventory and monitoring, and and guides us in in um, in determining what actions we're going to take to to manage the wildlife and wildlife habitat in the district. And as you can see from this slide, invasive species are the largest threat to um, three of the priority habitats in DC: hardwood forest, scrub shrub ecosystems, and meadow ecosystems. Um, urban landscapes. They, they weren't as much of a threat, but <clears throat> there's also less wildlife value in urban landscapes. And this similar ranking is true for aquatic systems, riparian forests and uh, emergent wetlands and things like that, invasive species, and, and then sedimentation were the top two threats to those, to those areas. Um, so one thing that the Wildlife Action Plan tells us is what actions we're supposed to take to to improve wildlife habitat and to improve the rare species, the situation for rare species in the district. And those actions are, are listed here. Uh, we do wildlife inventory and monitoring. We do fisheries management. Um, the Wildlife Action Plan tells us to do invasive plant management. And specifically in that plan was uh, the idea that we should form cooperative partnerships. And the main reason for that is our agency doesn't own any land in the district. So if we want to do any work we would all, to improve wildlife habitat, we would have to work on another agency's land or on some on federal land. So we decided the best thing to do would to be would to be to form cooperative partnerships with the National Park Service, with the National Arboretum, um, with DC government agencies that own land, like the DC Department of Transportation and DC Parks and Recreation, um, and then also to include in those partnerships uh, some of the local nonprofit organizations that are concerned with conservation in the district. Um, and so that's what we've done, and um, it's been about three years since we started forming our cooperative weed management area. Maybe a little bit longer, about four years. Um, but really three years ago is when we really started buckling down and, and getting some work done. Uh, so I'm going to move on to CWMAs and how they work. And um, I already talked about, I already showed this slide earlier, but I wanted to talk about how they work well. And most of this is from the Mid-Atlantic Invasive Plant Network CWMA cookbook. And um, the main thing uh, and we've tried to follow all these. In the next couple of slides, I'll show how we did this, but um, I'll just go through this quickly. Um, the main thing is to have uh, frequent 
highly visible collaborative events and projects, so including all your partners, reaching out to as many groups as you can to have these, have these events. Um, another thing is to hold public meetings or, or one main public meeting at the beginning of the cooperative weed management area. We did that about a, uh, almost two years ago. We had a public meeting and we had about 60 people attend that. And ever since then, we've been recruiting more partners and, and um, more volunteers to our cooperative weed management area. But that was the that was the main that was the first time we we had a public meeting and told people about the the cooperative weed management area. Um, we also have a lot of outreach events and volunteer projects, and we really try to have a couple of very big ones every year that include many of our partners, uh, and then and then also some smaller ones that would probably only include you know volunteers from one individual partner, and it will just be at one site. Uh, and then, and then the next thing is collaborative events and collaborative research. And right now, we're planning, uh, we're working on a proposal to to do some uh, early detection research, so looking for new and emerging invasive plant species in the district, and figuring out a way to um, to identify early early detection targets before they become a problem. And, and figure out you know a little bit of the biology of some of these plants that are that are just becoming established here in the district um, and then the the other and one of the main things is is searching for funding uh, for and with multiple partners and it's definitely an advantage to have multiple partners and even to be a multi-state cooperative weed management area uh, because many of the the, the uh, RFPs that we are looking at call for partnerships, call for lever leveraging the funds between multiple partners and multiple states and multiple agencies. So those things are all, all things that, are, that we've kind of worked on to make the cooperative weed management area work well. And um, how we've done it is uh, first off was we need a good leader. And for a long time I was the leader, but I, I, I kind of had to split my time between a number of different responsibilities. And so we really got going about a year and a half ago when we got a, a Student Conservation Association intern who acted as a full-time coordinator. And she really pushed us and kind of stepped us up to the next level. Um, the next thing is partners have to share your vision. Uh, they need, you need to have multiple people there lending assistance on planning projects, providing leadership for new ideas and new projects. And, and all sorts of things like that. It can't be just one person or one partner within the cooperative weed management area or things are, are just going to stagnate. Um, the next thing that we tried to do is set measurable and achievable goals. And we've tried to make them small and short-term goals so far. Um, we do have a two-year grant that we're implementing right now from the Forest Service. And so we did have to set kind of a two-year schedule for, for that work under that grant, um, but it was still, we were still able to have a number of s sites and a s number of small goals that we know we can accomplish at individual sites within that long term, uh, within that long term grant period. Um, the next thing is we've worked hard to maintain the participation of our members, uh, attaining that critical mass. Uh, it's been relatively easy, easy here in the district because there's it's a smaller space and there's fewer um, while we have a lot of partners there's limited number of sites where we can work and um, one thing that I've found is an advantage is there's so many nonprofit groups here in the district that even if they're not conservation oriented you can still get them to work uh, and work with you and my example of that is the Washington Area Bicyclist Association uh, participated with us in a Martin Luther King Day event where we cut invasive vines along uh, the Capitol Crescent Trail, which, run, which is a multi-use path that runs through northwest D.C. right along the CNO Canal. And um, so we were able to leverage a group that wants to maintain that trail and get them to come out and help us do invasive plant management. Um, the next thing is um, successfully avoid administrative barriers and institutional obstacles. 
and um, we've definitely done that. The, the main example I have for that is working with the Student Conservation Association, who was our main um, applicant for the, the Forest Service grant that's currently funding our work. Uh, we, my agency and the National Park Service agencies were specifically kept out of applying for that grant because it's targeted towards non-federal land. And so we were, we had to figure out a way that we could work, we could find someone to apply for the grant who could do the work and, and also find a number of sites that are on non-federal land in the district that are important to wildlife habitat. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and we've been successful in doing that. And we're also currently working on another grant uh, proposal for the same program, and that one would be led by the Anacostia Watershed Society. Um, the next thing is uh, share responsibility across all the different projects. And within the district, uh, we've been able to successfully ignore jurisdictional boundaries, um, not necessarily ignore them, but make, make use of them and make use of being able to work right at the boundary between DC owned land and National Park Service land and being able to cross that boundary when we need to because the plants do it without even the plants just do it by their nature so we have to be able to do it as well and um, some things that we're still working on and trying to grow our community support getting our name out there uh, there, are, there are a number of avenues that we can be doing that in the district that we that we haven't yet um, looked at but we're, we're trying to expand that a little bit more in the in the coming months. And then the main thing we've also been doing is ad adapting to changing conditions. And uh, that's something you just have to, in general, have to keep in mind. Whenever things are changed, you have to be able to be flexible and, and adapt to that. Um, so I was going to go through some of the challenges of urban areas and some of the specific challenges in the district, and then how, we, how we've made turn some of these into opportunities. Um, there are unique pressures on natural areas in an urban setting, and um, these ab apply to both wildlife management and invasive species issues. Overuse uh, creates impacts. Humans and dogs and bikes, bicycles, the more people you have in a, in a site, you're always going to have more impacts from those, from those people, either spreading invasive plants into the forest or uh, scaring wildlife when dogs are off-leash, things like that. Um, so those are some of the overuse issues. And, and many of our parks, Rock Creek Park, CNO Canal Park, those are very well used parks and, and almost to the point of being too well used and too well loved. Another thing is overbrowse. We have uh, an overabundance of deer in, the, in northwest DC and we have an overabundance of uh, resident Canada geese in, along the Anacostia River and along those wetlands. And both of those species are going to overbrowse um, native plants and selectively um, avoid eating plants that they don't recognize or that are unpalatable. And uh, so that will increase the number of invasive plants at where they are where they are um, located. And it also reduce native forest plant uh, native tree recruitment and other herbaceous plant recruitment. All of these things are just creating more of an opportunity for invasive plants to invade our natural areas here. Um, we also have a number of fragmented parcels that are not necessarily connected. And a lot of these have high edge to area ratios, so they don't have that deep forest habitat, that habitat that's far away from the edges, that's going to be more less likely to have invasive plants come in there uh, or, or, or penetrate into the deep areas. Um, and then in the district, we also have multiple ownerships uh, multiple boundaries where where different parcels of land meet up, and another thing finally is um, nutrification and trash and just the the reduction of aesthetic value that comes with urban areas um, that a lot of people see green no matter what it is as being good, whereas if you know that a, a canopy of porcelain berry isn't good, then you don't even if it's green you don't know it. But everyone realizes that trash and too much algae in the river, th things like that. Those are, people always realize that those are bad things. Um, some of these apply directly to the district. Uh, our area is definitely overused, as I, um, as I mentioned. Um, many, one of the things that I didn't so far is many invasives are very well established. 
they've they've been here for as almost as long as the district has been here. And typically, it's plants that were used in the horticultural industry, um, <clears throat> like bush honeysuckle, and um, in the in the uh, in the rivers, we have invasive blue carp and uh, blue catfish and snakehead. And then in Rock Creek Park, we have nightcrawler earthworms that are basically churning over the soil. Some places it looks like uh, someone brought a rototiller into the forest and just just rototilled the entire thing. Um, another thing is in D.C. we've had a lack of invasive plant management for many years, for decades. And a good example is the site uh, in the picture on the bottom, which is Kingman Island on the Anacostia River. And that site, it was owned by the National Park Service for a long time and then transferred to the district in the mid-1990s and never had invasive plant management on it. It was used, it's dredge material island, it has degraded soils, it was used as a dump for a while. Um, at some point there was a plan to turn it into uh, an amusement park for children, but that didn't pan out. And now it's, it's a natural park owned by Washington, D.C., and the plan is to restore that area, um, but it's, the soils are so degraded, it's very compacted, and the entire understory of 40-acre island except for the one open meadow is bush honeysuckle and so since it's never been managed there's 30 year old bush honeysuckle there that are very difficult to deal with and so that you know that's one thing that we have to look at when we're looking at um, sites and selecting priority sites for management um, and that goes directly to displaced soils there's a lot of reclaimed land uh, Kingman Island was a small natural island that was built with dredge material and and it's reclaimed it's land that's been created and built out of material from the bottom of the Anacostia River and those soils are very compacted they can be toxic uh, have toxic substances in them they can have um, typically have a lot of trash like broken glass and things and one thing I've noticed just anecdotally from the forest canopy that is developing on Kingman Island is it's mostly uh, black locust and I, I suspect that possibly it's because the that's one of the only th trees that can grow there because it's it's a legume and it can fix its own nitrogen I'm, and I'm assuming that the soil is just so degraded that no other trees have really gotten a been able to get a foothold there um, and then one other challenge that we have here in the district is we have many landowners and many of them are federal landowners and the National Park Service has very specific rules for doing invasive plant management and who can work where and permitting and those sorts of things and those are all just hurdles that you have to jump through and, and it really helps to have a partnership uh, to, to have agreements in place where you can just get the work done when it needs to get done. Um, and then I've, I've tried to take some of these challenges and look at them as opportunities and that, that's that's some things that we've done and, and have been successful in and I was looking at um, overuse as a way you know because people are out there and they're out there seeing you work you can use that as a way to raise awareness with the public um, not just with people who are already in, interested in invasive plant management or natural areas but someone who's just jogging they'll see you working out there and they're interested in what you're doing and you can talk to them about it. And we've actually recruited volunteers that way, and they've come out just because they saw us working and they, they wanted to talk to us and find out what we were doing. Um, and the density, just the, the number of people in an urban area, almost creates an, an automatic volunteer base. And D.C. is lucky in that we have a lot of conservation-based nonprofit groups, and they're very well-known. The most well-known is Anacostia Watershed Society. We also have the Rock Creek Conservancy. These are in the Nature Conservancy has had a presence here for a long time. And so these are groups that people know about and they're working in the district. They're working with a variety of populations and demographics in the district to do invasive plant management or to do conservation in general. Um, and then another thing is that uh, invasives, because of the density, invasives are visible. They can be a, per a problem in, in private property, just in people's yards. Uh, the best example is English ivy growing up trees or growing as a ground cover uh, all over the place in D.C., not only in natural areas, 
because you, typically it became established in people's yards when they planted it, and then it spread into natural areas. So there's there's that we actually have a program underway with Rock Creek Conservancy to not only manage the English ivy on trees in Rock Creek Park, but also to 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 do outreach into the neighborhood surrounding Rock Creek Park to convince them and to show them how to remove the English ivy from their trees. Um, the, the easiest way for it to spread is when it seeds and the birds eat the seeds and it only seeds when it's grown up up a tree and arborized and gotten enough sunlight to mature and so removing that seed source would go a great way to removing new invasions into into the natural areas. Um, and then we also have a good opportunity to combine efforts. So when we do volunteer events, it's not just removing trash or cleaning up an area. We can also offer different things like invasive plant management. So it creates a variety of opportunities for people when they go out and do volunteer events. Um, and then the other thing that I've I've wanted to I've really tried to push is the, the en environmental justice aspect of um, of doing this sort of invasive plant management and, and the cooperative weed management area. So we have a, we've had a lot of, you know, we've had a bad economy for a number of years and we've had a number of projects and uh, going on that, uh, that, cre that are training and trying to create green jobs um, in, in a variety of communities in the district. And we have a number of partners who specifically do green job training as a part of their programming. And so, uh, combining that with invasive plant management and also combining with our, the mayor's new focus on sustainability, we've really started to push into, um, into growing our environmental justice and, and working in areas that are typically under, underutilized and also not on the radar of, of, the, of the larger general public. Um, and what that's also something we're including in our most recent proposal that we're working on is trying to trying to create a jobs program that one of our partners can implement to do invasive plant management to run summer crews in the in the upcoming summers so that we have the funding and we're hiring from known training programs that we've already worked with in the past and I think that's going to be real successful it has been in the past um, <clears throat> So just a little bit about the, the cooperative weed management area and what we've, uh, what we've done in the last, uh, I guess, five years if we look at our initial meetings, which started in 2008. Um, we started meeting with the National Park Service and the Nature Conservancy and just talking about this about five years ago. And the first thing that we did was um, kind of implement a, a uh, pilot project where we managed Tree of Heaven, Ilanthus Altissima, along Canal Road, which is a road that runs directly adjacent to the CNO Canal in Washington, D.C. And what we did was um, work with the Nature Conservancy and the Park Service to get approval to use herbicides on the, on the Tree of Heaven and take them all out. And DDOE did the initial... Um, mapping and, and inventory of all the trees that were growing along there. And the National Park Service provided us with uh, herbicides and with a boat to get along because we couldn't, um, we couldn't get to the, they were on the far side of the canal and there was no access except for with a boat. Um, and then the Nature Conservancy and, and me with DDOE, we worked together to actually go out and, and herbicide the trees. And we did that two years in a row. And uh, we were very successful. I was driving down Canal Road the other day, and I think there's out of about 200 or 250 initial initial stems that we inventoried. I think we got, um, I think we got about 99 percent. I only saw 20 or so trees that are still growing up there. And one of the interesting things about that is we took out those trees, and they were actually replaced for the most part. They were over, they were overgrown by a trumpet creeper, which is really a really common vine that grows along the, um, the, the seawall that holds up Canal Road. <clears throat> and so that was a very successful project, I think. Right now we're also working on the far side of Canal Road, inventorying all of the uh, trees that have English ivy on them. That's actually a part of Rock Creek Park. 
directly adjacent to CNO Canal Park. Um, so that's what we, we did initially. And uh, we started working on a uh, grant proposal from the U.S. Forest Service, the state and private forestry grant program, which comes out of the northeastern area. And, um, and in doing that, we also we were trying to grow and find more partners. So we expanded in the last couple of years, um, adding uh, Urban Forestry Administration, which uh, administers the street trees and takes care of the street trees in the district, and also trees, uh, large trees on DC government property. Um, and they also have the state forester. The grant that we applied for has to go through the state forester to the Forest Service, so we included them. And we've added a lot of partners recently. The University of the District of Columbia Cooperative Extension Service has an education program for invasive plant management, and they've been really great in working with us and um, helping us do some, put on some trainings. And hopefully in the future, they have a um, some greenhouses and an experimental farm in Maryland in the town of Laurel. And hopefully they're going to, in the future, we're going to be start doing native plant propagation at that site so that we can be, uh, so we can be restoring sites as soon as we do invasive plant management on them. We've also added the Student Conservation Association. They're the main, they were the main applicant on the grant that's currently funding our, our work. And, uh, and then we work closely with some other groups, Living Classrooms of DC. They, they manage Kingman Island, which I showed earlier. Um, and they've been a great partner. Uh, Dumbarton Oaks Conservancy and Rock Creek Conservancy, they both work in Rock Creek in the district. And then Rock Creek Conservancy also works in the entire Rock Creek watershed which goes about 12 miles up into Montgomery County. Um, we did a lot of green, uh, a lot of trainings in the past with uh, DDOE has a green summer jobs program where we hire about 800 people every summer, um, usually teenagers up to about 21 years old, and train them to do all sorts of uh, green jobs, anything from planting trees to working on improving streetscapes to cleaning up trash, um, helping to uh, hand out, I think they handed out a lot of different flyers that we have, encouraging people to join some of our programs, um, things like that. And one of the things that we work with them was to train them to do invasive plant management and, and actually had them work at a number of sites. Uh, we had a couple of crews that their specific job was to do invasive work. And that, that was a pretty good program over the last couple of years. It's really been scaled back by the current um, administration, though. And then we applied for the current grant that's that's funding us, and um, we're currently implementing that grant. And what that grant gave us was a uh, through the Student Conservation Association a full-time intern who acts as the Cooperative Weed Management Area Coordinator. The first person started in December 2011 and worked for about nine months, and then my boss actually hired her out from under me and. She's now my coworker doing aquatic uh, resource education. And then so we hired another coordinator in February 2013. And um, a couple other parts of that grant that we uh, are implementing was we put into the proposal that we would do three to five signature volunteer events. And those have turned into pretty large events. We had DC Invasives Day in the spring on May 4th, and we, I think we had about 100 volunteers at eight different sites throughout the city. Uh, we've also worked with SCA on their MLK Day event. They typically have a very large volunteer event somewhere in the district on MLK Day. Um, and then the big one is just this fall, I think I might mention it later on also on a different slide, is uh, just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had an event with um, the George Washington University. They have a freshman day of service where all of their income fre in incoming freshmen do a day of service. And last year we got um, 700, and I think this year we got 800. Last year we put them out at um, six or seven different sites, and this year we had eight different sites with, I think, 12 different partners working at all the different sites. So and re we really got a lot done with them. It's great to have that one day event where we can work all over the city on all sorts of things. And typically they do, when they work with us, they just do invasive plant management, but they they um, place every freshman and they do all sorts of things. They'll paint classrooms, they'll do 
you know, park cleanups and things like that, but ours just did invasive plant management. Um, in 2012, we also had our public meeting, and we formed a number of committees. Uh, we have um, you know, a planning committee, and we have an a early detection rapid response committee, and a native plant nursery committee that we're you know, all these things are they're basically working groups that we're trying to um, advance our projects through. Um, and then in the in summer of 2012, we had an SCA community crew, which is a high school crew, and we did invasive plant management on district-owned sites and then helped out at a few National Park Service sites a couple days during that summer. Um, and then we also, last year, we had our, our big, our, we had two big training events where we put on uh, integrated pest management training, chemical methods, uh, mechanical methods, chemical safety, MSDS, all sorts of topics uh, that are important to to learn and, and know about before you do invasive plant management on a large scale. And um, and so those were those were very successful events. We had one at Rock Creek Park and we had another one up at Catoctin Mountain Park in Maryland. Um, and then <clears throat> Last summer, I just have a map here of some of what we did. Uh, this is Heritage Island, which is right next to Kingman Island. And we removed bush honeysuckle and a bunch of vines, invasive vines, porcelain berry, and, and uh, Japanese honeysuckle in this area. The area in blue is an area that's pretty much covered by porcelain berry. And our goal for this year is to uh, we're actually going to try to do management with goats in the fall with living classrooms and then follow it up in the spring once everything is re-sprouted, follow it up with uh, herbicide application. And that's about an acre or an acre and a half, the area in blue there. Um, in 2013, we added some more partners. A lot of these are small um, nonprofit groups that do community building and uh, environmental or conservation work, groundwork, Anacostia, Washington Parks and People. They've both been um, really good partners in working with them, trying to, uh, to do some of the green job training. Um, we also, this year in the spring, we started a Weed Warrior program, which was uh, Weed Warriors was a, a program started by Carol Bergman in Montgomery County, Maryland, as she works for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. And uh, we basically just cribbed her program. It's a way to train volunteers and get them working uh, independently on specific sites where you can, where you know that they, they know the plants and they can do the invasive plant management. And they don't have to be there when there's, lead, when there's guidance from someone who's the landowner. And right now we have the program working at Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens yeah, but we hope to expand it, which is a National Park Service site. We hope to expand it into uh, a number of other areas, uh, including DC-owned sites, which are, which traditionally are, are smaller. They have more invasive plant issues, and they ha also have had almost no invasive plant management. Um, this year, we also did integrated pest management training projects again, events. Uh, we had one at the National Conservation Training Center, and we had one at Fort DuPont Park here in the district. And this year, we were able to all offer continuing ed education credits for D.C., Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. So I think that's something we're really going to try to continue to do every year, and I think it's been one of our most successful, uh, most successful projects to date. I think uh, the two that we had this year, I think we reached about 150 people. So I think that's that's been really great. Um, and then we've also implemented implemented some things like a newsletter, quarterly newsletter, and a, a mailing list. And I already mentioned DC Invasive Days. We also tried to do uh, quarterly events where it's just one partner that we're working with, and where they they bring their own volunteers, and we just kind of help it, help them out with coordination and um, expertise and assistance on site during the day of the project. Um, and then just a little bit about some of the summer work. This summer we had a SCA core team, which is their adults, uh, 18 or older, and we actually got them registered under my um, 
pesticide certificate so they could apply herbicides with me. And we had a number of sites, major sites in, in the dis all throughout the district. Uh, Kingman Island, which I've already mentioned before, Suitland Parkway, which is, I hope everyone can see my mouse, Suitland Parkway is down here, east of the Anacostia River. Soapstone Valley is a, is a part of the National Park Service, but it's got a, a DC uh, Department of Transportation right-of-way running right through the middle of it. Uh, so we did some invasive plant management along there. De La Carlier Parkway runs along the De La Carlier Reservoir up here in the northwest, and Pope Branch Park is just adjacent to uh, Fort DuPont Park, east of the Anacostia River. Uh, and then this picture on the bottom left shows uh, some of the sites we worked at at Suitland Parkway and, and some of the plants. There were a number of large stands of Japanese knotweed and bush honeysuckle and large stands of invasive trees that include Tree of Heaven and red, uh, white mulberry and Siberian elm. So we, we did a lot of work there. And our goal in the, next, in the next year is to continue that management and really restore that site with native plants. Um, so that was everything I had. I uh, hope I didn't talk too fast. And if you have any questions, um, I'm ready to take them. Hey, Damien. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions. The first was um, someone's curious to learn about when you're using the boats. Uh, what kind of boat were you using? Were you spraying from the boat or using it to get access to the banks? And did you have to get access agreements for some of the banks? Yeah, the boat, I, it, was, it was a rowboat, and it was owned by the National Park Service. And um, we, the method we were using, so we just used it to get across the canal to, there, there were, in most places there was about a between four and ten foot bank on the far side of the canal. So we would just row it over there and get out and, and, and leave the boat. Okay. Um, and the method we were using was hack and squirt, and so we, didn't, um, we weren't doing any spraying, uh, any broadcast application. Um, and it actually did take, for some of the larger trees, it took a second round, which is why we took two years. The, the first time we did it in the fall, and I think we were also close to when the trees were a little too far senesced to, be, to have it be as effective as it should be. Um, but then we did it the following August, and we, we got, like I said, I think we got close to 95% uh, effectiveness from that. Okay. Um, another question having to do with the university freshmen that you utilized. What kinds of tasks did you have them do? Uh, we've, because it's in the fall, we mostly have just been uh, cutting woody plants. The, the group that I had, we worked along the canal and we just cut bittersweet. And it, it's, it's good because there's a, well, it's bad that there's a lot of bittersweet there. Um, but it's good because it's pretty easy to identify. And once you've showed them, uh, shown them what bittersweet vines look like, both real small ones up to, I think the biggest one was about four and a half or five inches. They're 25-year-old bittersweet vines. Hmm. Once you've shown them what they look like, then it's, they can just go at it. And there was some native grapevine growing interspersed with them and a few other native vines like um, Virginia creeper. What we did was we went out beforehand and marked as many locations as we could with just a little metal uh, flagging, uh, little flags with metal posts, and marked uh, clusters of vines and then tied flagging onto the native grape vines with just a little note that says, native grape, do not cut. Hmm. And um, we were successful in not cutting any native grape unless it was some small ones where you had a just a big mass of vines and you really couldn't differentiate. Um, but we didn't cut any big native grape vines and we got, um, I think I think we cut with about 90, 90 uh, freshmen out there and in about two or two and a half hours we cut about 300 vines. So it was pretty successful. And we we're following that up because we didn't want to use herbicides with the volunteers out there. So we're following up with herbicide applications and I'm just going out and putting a fresh cut on the on the vine and then doing cut stump application of 30% glyphosate. 
Okay, kind of a follow-up to that question, what did you do with the cut brush? Uh, for the for the vines, we just uh, we just leave it. We just cut cut a window in the vines, and leave the the piece that we cut out on the ground. Okay. Um, to my knowledge, they won't re sprout. We did do uh, some of the other sites did management of uh, bush honeysuckle, and we were if they were small enough, we were having them dig them out or, or pull them out with a pitchfork, which is if they're small and it's rained recently. Uh, a heavy prongs, short-handled pitchfork is pretty effective at pulling out the, the bush honeysuckle. Okay. Um, if they're really big, you can really just cut them down, and you have to follow up when it re-sprouts. You have to follow up with herbicide application or come in and give it another another cut and do a cut mm -hmm. stump application. And, of course, I guess that takes long-term treatment on those sites as well. Um, I guess another question related is how did you house your SCA crew? Um, the core crew was, uh, they, I guess they were all local, and I think the SCA put that into the application when they, uh, when they advertised it. And I, I didn't really see much on that end because the grant goes directly to the Student Conservation Association, and I just basically work with the regional manager, and they tell me when they're starting, and I tell them where to show up and they show up with all their equipment it's pretty mm -hmm. it's pretty convenient so they only hired local um, local staff for that um, and the coordinator the, I think when they we, we they advertised for the coordinator they they did the same thing the coordinator does have I think they, there's money in the grant for a housing allowance but I think they know that um, it's it's going to be really hard to find housing here in the district with that or in the in the region with just that allowance so they made it so that they made sure that people knew that you really had to be from the area and already be established. Good. Here's a question and a kind of a statement. Uh, what's your position on public education? Do you think they can really help this national slash global effort? And it says I've been involved with agencies since 2009 and want us to do more to get the public's help even if it's just clearing up their invasives on their personal property. So what's your position on the public education? Do you think it can really help in this global effort? Yeah, I, I think it can. And I, I think it's one, one area we haven't pursued well enough here. I mean, we do have our aquatic education staff, and part of, part of their curriculum includes um, aquatic invasive species, so, you know, which includes things like Phragmites and purple loosestrife, but also aquatic invasive animals. Um, <clears throat> and that staff really reaches out and, and, and gets to a lot of younger, you know, uh, elementary school students and, and I guess even high school students uh, in the district. And I think schools come from um, even outside D.C. to go to, a, we have a little aquarium down on the Anacostia River. Um, but reaching adults is I think a little bit more difficult and I think one thing that we we've talked about we had a couple of meetings that we attended but we have um, uh, advisory neighborhood commissions here in the district which are kind of little small districts within DC where they have local um, locally elected uh, it would be the equivalent of a of a congressional district in a state but we don't have we don't have congressional districts here so they're just neighborhood advisory committees and they have periodic meetings which we could attend and it'd be it'd be pretty easy for us to get our name out there attending those um, but you know though they're they typically have pretty full schedules and they you know most people their agendas are already set for these things so it, it would just take a little bit of pre-planning to get involved in those um, yeah most of our outreach has been to sort of two populations that are already already have this sort of thing on the radar um, but we the uh, trying to reach people in their own yards and, and show them how they can improve their own yards we've done that both through the the Rock Creek Conservancy and their outreach to to neighborhoods around Rock Creek to manage English ivy on their trees and then I've done a good bit I think I've reached about 500 or 700 people over the last five years. I do these backyard wildlife habitat workshops. So that's trying to teach people about planting native plants and the benefits of gardening with native plants. 
Um, and as a part of that, I, I do my best to disparage non-native and invasive plants in the horticultural industry. Maybe you have a time for a couple more questions? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, another kind of practical one is how do you provide enough tools for everyone? I think a lot of people that are on the line are either working with CWAs or CWMAs or working with volunteers. So I think these practical questions are good. So how do you provide enough tools for everyone, such as your SCA? Yeah, group? we we have uh, through the Green Summer Jobs Program that I mentioned. Uh, DDOE owns uh, a lot of tools. They're not the highest quality tools, but they're they're good enough for volunteers. And so they're like wooden short wooden handled loppers and small um, pruners bypass pruners, and we have bow saws. I think we have about 50 bow saws. Um, so we, we kind of have the beginnings of a tool bank, and we've also talked about I increasing the size of that tool bank with a number of our partners. Um, and so we use those tools whenever we have volunteer events. We, we can loan those out to any of our partners, uh, and, and that's been, it's one of the, it's been one of the best contributions that my agency has been able to give to our partners because we can arrange and organize a bunch of volunteer events but if if our nonprofit partners don't already have the capacity to put on those events either through you know through their grants or through their you know being able to pay their staff to put on an event you know we haven't really helped them we've only just kind of added to their calendar and so I've I've always been able to try to I've been trying to figure out how we can be be a, a help to them and, and not a hindrance when we're trying to add stuff to their calendar. And providing tools, I feel like, has been one of the things that we've been able to do. Um, Good. As, uh, associated with that would be like our integrated pest management trainings, where they're free, and if you can get to it, you're going to be you're going to be able to recertify yourself. Um, so those are some of the practical things we've been doing. Great. Um, I'm going to finish with this question, and I think it's a good way to kind of close up. But what kinds of roles have you carved out for um, other CWMA members, and how you know to share responsibility in the work that you're doing? Uh, yeah, I guess the the biggest one was the Student Conservation Association, and just working with them to get the the grant that's funded uh, the coordinator for the last year and a half. Uh, and and the there are summer work crews, and what we did, kind of I guess a, a practical example is when we we worked on that, um, the grant proposal for that probably a little bit more than two years ago I think it was summer 2011, we sat down on a conference call and kind of just threw some ideas out, and I think and and, and had a, a number of ideas that we brainstormed and then. I took those ideas and, and wrote out what I thought would be a good narrative and a good project and gave it to the SCA and they worked it into, um, you know, fit it into the programs that they already have that they they already know, knew the budget for and knew the time frames for their community crews and their core crews. So they just, they were able to fit that narrative into their budget and we you know we worked out all the sites that we were going to try to work on over the course of the three year grant and we worked out a lot of those details uh, we also included the Anacostia Watershed Society as the partner who would do a lot of the training for for the the community and core crews and so we we kind of just worked together um, collaborating uh, mostly through electronic means to get the the narrative and the grant proposal put together and we're right in the middle of that process right now. I was this morning. I was working on the grant proposal for the same program, to uh, that's gonna, hopefully going to fund a coordinator through. This time it would be through the Anacostia Watershed Society, and you know, hopefully this will give us the capacity to to find and keep funding long term for a full time coordinator. Great. Well, Damien, thank you so much for your time and your um, insight. I think it's very informative, and I hope everyone got a lot of good information out of this. I assume it's okay for everyone to give you a call or an email if they have any more questions. Yeah, sure, that would be fine. Okay. 
and you can find the presentation recorded at the website if you wanted to review anything that Damien had talked about. So thank you, Damien. Thank you for everyone for sitting in and listening today. And hope everyone has a good evening. Thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm.